This is Bruce Wall from the City of Scottsdale's Neighborhood College Program. We're all in this together. The City of Peoria, we're in this together. The City of Chandler, we're in this together. Hi, this is Jamie from the City of Scottsdale with my daughter Jocelyn. We're in this together. City of Tempe, we are in this together. <laughs> now we're going to switch over and start answering the questions that we've received. First question is from Barnes. Do you handle collections in Tucson? Uh, yes, I do. So that's question number one out of 26. Um, our firm handles all legal matters pertaining to associations, violations, collections throughout the state of Arizona. Um, although our office is located in Phoenix on Camelback um, on 31st Street, um, all courts now are operating on a virtual platform. So it's, um, you know, we're all over the state and it doesn't cost you any extra money because we're able to appear everything virtually. Everything's virtual right now with the courts anyways. Next question from Dana. Is it permissible for an HOA activity or a club in an HOA to require full vaccination to participate? Um, my opinion on that is it's not advisable at this point. Is it permissible? You know, I would say no at this point because I, I don't believe that any of you have that in your documents, you know, that they would have that as a requirement. Um, and like I said earlier in the presentation, I think it's an invasion of somebody's, you know, privacy, frankly, to do that. Um, next question is from Carol. Our CCNRs are very specific that parking on any street is strictly prohibited. If the community wants to change this, does this require a formal change to the CCNRs? Or can this be done by a rules change by the architectural committee? So Carol, good question. If your CCNRs say something specific, you cannot change it by doing a rule change. So the short answer on that would be no. The section in the CCNRs on parking is enforceable and should be enforced by the board until you amend that section in the CCNRs and take that out. Tony, next question, number four. Our HOA has an on-site restaurant and bar and board members are required to be the holder of the liquor license. We are listed as managers, but a previous board had approved a policy giving day-to-day -day control of the association to a general manager from our management company. The policy states that board members will not interfere with the day-to-day -day operations of the facility. The GM is not on the license. Is this not a conflict as we assume responsibility for the operation but have no control? Okay, so Tony, that's a very good question. Um, I think that's something that you need to escalate to your legal counsel, because if you're listed as the holder of the liquor license, there either need to be very formal policies in place in terms of compliance with the rules, um, you know, as prescribed by the state pertaining to, you know, the sale of alcoholic beverages. So I think bring your legal counsel in on that. You guys need to meet in the middle. Um, either the GM is the authorized license person or, um, you know, we, we need to have specific policies in place so that the GM is, is following all the restrictions that the state places on this. Um, I have another liquor license question. I don't know if any of you know this, but in my prior career, um, I used to work as a liquor lawyer for Miller Brewing Company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So when I was in law school, I worked in their legal department for almost three years. So I, I actually have very familiar with liquor law um, through that position. Okay, so I'm a new planned community board director. Our community has a restaurant with a liquor license. Our community has an outside agent of record on the liquor license, but our management company, general manager, is wanting directors to sign on to the license. Do directors at this level need to be Arizona residents? What are the director's responsibilities when the restaurant employees are hired and trained by the management company? Okay, so this kind of goes along with Tony's question, Evie. This is something that you, you need to get your legal counsel involved in. I mean, I have to say, in with representing over a thousand associations, I have never seen a board have individual board members be the liquor license holders um, for a restaurant on the premises. So I think you, you need to open the dialogue with your legal counsel or maybe our firm can come in and, and talk about this more with your board, but there are some red flags that I have here. And I think all these issues need to be talked out. 
Okay, sixth question is from Karen. Community manager does not want to enforce patio and common elements violations because there are too many and it's too expensive to enforce them. How can we ensure violations are enforced? Um, okay, Karen, so I think it's odd that the community manager is saying we're not gonna enforce it because there are too many and it's too expensive. Um, I think what you need to do is, I mean, I don't know if this are like nitpicky things like the hose isn't in the hose holder or if they're more serious things, you know, like this, something on the patio, like they changed out the wall and it used to be a block wall and now it's a, you know, a chain link fence or something. So I don't really know what the violations are, but I mean, there's a difference between being a nitpicker on some of these violations and actual violations that it's clear it's a violation of your documents. So a couple of things to keep in mind, the board dictates policy, not the community manager. The manager, the attorney, your insurance agent, your reserve specialists, we're on your team, but you're the boss. So we can give you our opinion and our advice, um, but ultimately you make the decision. So I would open up the dialogue with the manager and figure out, you know, why exactly, you know, they're not enforcing it and come to some common ground. Maybe you even need to get your legal counsel involved to help you navigate what's the right way to handle these violations. Seventh question is from Clark. How should we handle short-term rentals and even condo owners that want to rent out a room? Okay, so short-term rentals, you need to look at what your documents say. You know, do they allow less than 30-day rentals? Um, you know, or do you have a minimum rental period? Um, look at what your documents say and then enforce them. If your most documents in Arizona right now do not have anything in there about short-term rentals because the law changed. And when the law changed, a lot of associations, you know, what the law said is if you want to have short-term rental restrictions in your CCNRs, you have to pass an amendment to your CCNRs to have that language in there. And a lot of associations, it's really difficult to amend CCNRs. So um, if I had to guess, maybe your association doesn't have any short-term rental restrictions. So handle it, go to our rental cheat sheet and look at the different legal options that you have. I mean, obviously the, the renter has to be violating the documents in order for you to enforce something. So um, what about owners who want to rent out a room? Again, look at the language of your documents. Typically it has to be single family housing, which you know typically means, you know, the persons have to be related in some way, um, but the language of your documents will give you direction on that. And if your association needs help on how to handle these short-term renters violations or, you know, owners who are renting out a room, um, reach out to your legal counsel or our firm and we can help you navigate that. Next question, number eight is from Tony and she's a homeowner or he's a homeowner. My HOA is a developer controlled until 100% of the lots are sold. In our design guidelines, there's a requirement that a side driveway extension be connected to the existing driveway curved to the side gate and not from the street sidewalk. Many homeowners have extended the side driveway from the sidewalk and some violations are more than a year old. HOA manager says they are aware of the violations but won't give any details on the progress of enforcement due to state privacy laws. How long should it take to bring a violator to court? Does a developer-controlled HOA have any desire to take legal actions? Okay, so Tony, I think probably what's happening here is that the developer is allowing a lot of these violations, and this is a common problem. Sometimes the developer even puts a letter in the owner's file saying, even though you know the CCNRs say this, we're going to allow this. So developers typically, in my experience, don't want a lot of hassles and they don't want to spend a bunch of money in legal fees, you know, pursuing owners on violations. So if I had to guess that's what's happening here, um, they're stalling to bring the violators to court and they probably never will. They don't really have any desire to take legal action. They just want the property to look nice so that they can continue to sell lots or units in the association. Um, what you could do is ask to see the lot file of the owners that have this violation, you're entitled to see those records. You're not entitled to see um, any litigation that's pending or any advice from legal counsel on this issue under the statute. So you could check to see their file to see if they have an architectural application for this, if it's been approved or not approved. I would document it by 
sending letters to the board, it's developer control board, stating that you're asking them to enforce it. You might even want to consider going to the Arizona Department of Real Estate and filing, you know, a $500 one claim petition and have the Department of Real Estate handle it. Um, all of these are suggestions on how you might be able to handle it. Question nine from Alan. We are a community of only 38 single family homes. Do we need to receive monthly paper HOA assessment statements since we were under 50 homes? I can't answer that question unless I know if you have a management company or not. Um, you know, so if you're an association that does not have a management company, then likely no, you're not going to have to do a monthly paper statement. Um, but I don't have enough information to answer that. So, I mean, best practices, of course, is going to be to, um, you know, make sure you're communicating with your owners if they have a past due balance with your association regardless. Question 10 from Clark, our HOA is updating our governing documents and wondering how to handle transferring a unit to kids and having them pay the preservation fee that is in place. Okay, great question. So, First, I would direct you to our cheat sheet on amending CCNRs, a five-step plan. We have a great summary of the procedure your association may want to consider for amending their documents, and it's a great plan that will help you navigate the process. We have language in our documents. It, it, we have language that we put in our amendments that we help associations with um, that talks about the preservation fee, which is also kind of known as capital contribution fee or transfer fee. And if it's an estate planning transfer that the, you know, it, the transfer fee or preservation fee may not be charged. So um, we have language that we can help you with on that. Um, it just depends if you want to charge it or you don't want to charge it, you can write it right into the amendment. But I encourage you to check out our amending CCNR's five-step plan cheat sheet, which will be helpful with you going through that process. Next question is, um, Jerry, if a homeowner submits a formal request for an HOA board agenda item to discuss a rule, is it appropriate for the board to repeatedly refuse to deal with the issue? So we've got a homeowner here asking for the board to talk about something, a rule. Um, can the board refuse to deal with the issue? Short answer, yes. Um, so what can you do as a homeowner if you want the board to discuss it? Well, you can talk about it in the homeowner forum at your meeting. You can get a petition going in your community asking the board to you know, talk about this rule. Um, and the more owners that you get to sign it, the more likely the board will have to discuss it based upon pressure that the homeowners are putting on them um, or run for the board yourself so that then you can be part of the, the policy team that's deciding what's on the agenda for meetings and, and what rules are, are passed or not passed. Next question is from Helen. Don't you have to publish a fine schedule? So good question, Helen. No, you don't. So there was some discussion on this maybe two or three years ago where we had a case in Arizona that talked about um, you cannot levy or you cannot collect and levy fines unless you have a specific fine policy in place. Um, however, that case was depublished. And so that case is no longer um, you know, mandatory case law that we have to follow. Now, is it best practices? Yes. You, you know, some associations have a fine policy in place that they publish and that they talk about. Um, and, and they use it as a deterrent so that owners, um, you know, comply with the documents, but it's not a requirement. So um, I have some associations that have them. I have some associations that don't. You don't have to have it. Um, but again, just do what's best for your association. If you feel like it's important to have it, then do it. Ron, question 13, can you sidestep the legislative statute on fine collection by including the amount with the HOA transfer fee when the ownership changes? Ron, good question. Okay, so the, the, what Ron's getting, his point is, is that the statute requires that you have a, um, a judgment in order to collect a fine against an owner, right? But can we collect it when an owner has a bunch of fines that have been levied against the owner and they're selling their property can we just add it to the disclosure statement that is provided to the, the buyer at the time that the property is going to be closing escrow and the sale is going to be going through? So the short answer is, of course, yes, you can include the amount with the disclosure statement that the owner owes it. But 
it's not legal to do it that way. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. There's a lot of management companies that just throw that on the disclosure form and say that the seller owns, owes this money. And this needs to be cleared up prior to the transfer of the property. Um, And sometimes the seller pays it just to move on, um, even though there isn't a judgment. But if you have a savvy seller who's looking at this saying, you can't collect the fine unless you have a judgment against me, that's a very valid argument. And, um, you know, what's going to happen is the title company is not going to collect it because they're going to look at the statute and they're going to say, do you, do you have a judgment? And the association is going to say no. And the title company is going to say, then we're not collecting the money. So that's a possible outcome that can happen if you add it to the disclosure statement. I will tell you though, a lot of associations do do this. Um, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying this is happening and it is getting paid probably more likely than not. Next question is from Clark. Clark, you have a lot of questions today. Um, If you have fines that are uncollectible, can you file against an owner's credit report? So my opinion on that is no. You know, we don't ever advise that reporting on owner's credits reports due to the liability, even if it's an unpaid assessments judgment or a fines judgment. Um, You know, we think there's too much liability to be reporting um, on their credit under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, it's just, it's a lot of liability. You have to update it every time there's payment or an addition. So can you file against the owner's credit? Um, I don't think that you would be able to do that unless you had a judgment. And even if you have a judgment, I would advise against that based upon all the trip ups that you could have with the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Next question is from Gina. Can a homeowner request to speak at a board meeting without letting the board know what the subject is? just requested to be put on the agenda without anything further said. Okay, so Gina, that's likely not gonna be allowed by the board. Um, You know, what I would recommend instead is that you go to the homeowner forum at the association's board meeting and you make whatever statement you want then. Um, But the board meeting is truly, it's a time for the board to make decisions regarding the association. So it's not a free mic type of thing um, where you can just get up and say anything. Um, and so if you want to say something and not let the board know what the subject is, do it during the open session um, and be mindful, too, of, of what you're saying so that you know, you're know you careful that you're not defaming anybody or anything like that. OK, Alan, question 16. Can you go to small claims court without an attorney to collect overdue HOA fines? Yes, you can. So the board members could go to small claims court, file a small claims lawsuit against an owner um, and get a judgment in small claims court. Now you'd have to be under the jurisdictional limits, which I think it has to be under $2,500. So that, that definitely is an option if you want to do that. Question 17 from Dan. How do you advise associations regarding vehicle towing for persistent parking violations? So if you're going to tow a vehicle, my advice to you is make sure that, number one, the vehicle is parked in violation of your CCNRs. That's important. Number two, make sure you have the ability to tow in your CCNRs. Um, Number three, make sure you have the proper signage um, because there are state law requirements and possibly local law requirements that would require specific signage before you can tow tow a vehicle from the property. Um, and just be careful. The best advice I can tell you is towing lots of times results in lawsuits. So you want to make sure that you give the owner plenty of opportunities before you would ever tow them for, you know, a parking violation. Donna Lynn, question 18. For notices of violations, Arizona statutes mentions 21 days. Can the association be less restrictive, provide for a longer time, such as 30 days, and reverse, can the association be more restrictive, such as 14 days? Um, So the section that you're talking about in the the Arizona revised statute that talks about 21 days, that only really kicks in if there's a very specific event that occurs. So basically, um, what would have to happen is the association sends a formal violation notice And then the owner responds back by certified mail. And that's where that whole 21 days thing starts kicking in in terms of how long we have to respond with information that the owner may be requesting. Um, So it's hard for me to comment on your question because that is a very 
specific fact pattern with the um, owner responding by a um, certified mail and then the 21 day requirement kicking in. I guess the bottom line is for most violations, we don't deal with an owner responding back by certified mail. So for most violations, your board can pick how long they have to comply. And I mean, for like a painting violation, I mean, it's gonna be hard to get a painter in really fast. Um, and so you may have to give a longer period to, to comply. For an RV removal, you may give a shorter period to comply. So talk to your legal counsel as you're navigating the violations to find out what, you know, what the violation is, has the owner responded by certified mail to the violation letter, et cetera, to come up with a strategy for each violation. Question 19, Sheila, we are noticing other HOA communities adjacent to ours opening their outdoor common areas. So we feel pressure to follow suit. How do you know when it is the right time to reopen the use of an outdoor common area, such as a ramada to small gatherings by reservation? The adjacent pool is open and we do stress following CDC guidelines. So we're having less than 10 people washing hands. What guidelines should we put in place to reopen? Limit the number of people, but how would we monitor that? Ask the person reserving to sign a waiver, use at their own risk. Or to your point, do we wait until the governor addresses it specifically? Okay, so I think the governor really did address a lot of issues on March 5th, um, you know, on the reopening of Arizona businesses. And what we're starting to see with a lot of our clients in Arizona HOAs and condominiums is that they are starting to reopen common areas. That's a pretty common thing that we're seeing. Um, so if maybe the Ramada wasn't allowed to be used previously, now we are allowing the Ramada, but we have signage posted in the Ramada saying, um, you know, social distancing, no more than however many people is the number that you pick, follow CDC guidelines. Um, same thing on the pool, you know, we're, we have check out our reopening cheat sheet, you know, in terms of what types of signage you'd want to have on the pool to comply with the governor's orders. Um, it's really hard for us to monitor as we start to reopen the clubhouse and we reopen the ramadas and the benches and the, you know, maybe you have a, other meeting areas where people are, are meeting. It's, it's really hard to monitor it. So I think the signage should just make it clear that you're entering at your own risk and please follow social distancing, wear a mask and follow CDC guidelines. Um, I mean, of course, you can ask them to sign a waiver if they're reserving it. Um, the waiver, you know, can be helpful, but it's not going to limit all of our liability. So, I mean, I think now would be a good time for you to start thinking, Sheila, have your association start thinking about a plan for reopening. Reach out to your manager, reach out to your legal counsel and come up with a safe plan. Um, check out our cheat sheet on reopening because we give you a lot of good suggestions on that too. But I think things are starting to open up again. Now, mind you, if you have like an outbreak in your association, that would not be the time to be moving forward with um, reopening. So you have to look at all the facts and circumstances that are facing you right now and you know, try to make the best decision possible that you can for your community and reach out to your trusted advisors, your manager, your attorney, your insurance agent, and get their opinion on it. Question 20, um, Let's see, if a homeowner wants to rent a room in his or her home, oops, I skipped one, I'll go back to that one. Um, a homeowner wants to rent a room in his or her home. It concerns me this contributes to the decline of the neighborhood. Can this type of rental be denied by an HOA? So typically this type of rental is not allowed under your documents, but it's always really hard to prove that somebody's doing this. So, um, you know, you may be able to have a certain number of of unrelated persons living in a home. Um, you may wanna check with your city, town, or municipality to see if they have any other code restrictions as well. Um, but it's gonna be difficult to, for the HOA to prove it, but you're gonna to have to look at your association's documents to determine what this homeowner is trying to do, if it's legitimate or not under your documents. And also check with the city, town, and municipality to see what their restrictions are on something like this. Um, let's see, section, question 20 from Jeff. What is a reasonable fee for providing HOA documents to a new homeowner? They seem to vary so much from HOA to HOA. Okay, so Jeff, there's a law on this um, and we have a cheat sheet on this as well. 
It's called the disclosure fee. And the cheat sheet that we have is called disclosure versus transfer fees. And that's on our website. But basically the bottom line on it is whenever there's a sale of a property um, in an association that has 50 or more lots or units, um, the association is required by law to provide information to the buyer. And the maximum fee that you can charge is $400 for that. So some associations are charging less than that. Some are charging right at 400. It really just depends on what the baseline fee your association was charging when the law went into effect because they gave you a formula. When the law went into effect as to how you can increase it up to the $400 per sale. Okay, next question is from Eli regarding fines. Did you say at the last session that fines cannot be punitive and therefore not be collected if the owner corrects the violation? Just confirming this. I know I, I would never say that. Um, you know, fines can still be collected even if the owner does fix the violation. Uh, be reasonable as a board. Um, and what I mean by that is if there is a fine um, that is been charged against or levied against an owner and they're remorseful and they're not a repeat offender and the, the issue has been resolved. You may want to waive some of it. You may want to waive all of it. You may not want to waive it. You just have to look at how, you know, your association's board operates. Um, you know, my feeling is if somebody is remorseful, they address it right away and it's a first time deal, I probably would waive it as a board member, but you're not required to do that. So just know that. Um, okay, so I did not say that, Eli, the last time. Um, I just wanna clarify that. Okay, next question is from John Burt. Is there a difference between regularly scheduled monthly, quarterly and unplanned meetings? If a homeowner has specific exterior change requests, this architectural meeting would be scheduled between quarterly meetings. Must this specific meeting be announced 48 hours in advance with an agenda and available for all members to attend? So yes, okay, so a couple things on this. So we didn't talk too much about the open meeting law in today's session, but um, remember that anytime a quorum of the board is discussing association business, it needs to be an open board meeting and you need to give 48 hours notice to your members. This also extends to regularly scheduled committee member meetings, okay? So I'm guessing in this case is the regularly scheduled or the meeting that you're asking about is an architectural committee meeting. And so if your architectural committee meets at the same time and it's a regularly scheduled meeting every month, or let's just say they have a meeting every month, it doesn't have to be, you know, Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the pool, okay? It could just be every month they meet then yes, you need to give 48 hours in advance notice of the meeting. And it's a good idea to get the agenda, um, you know, for what's going to be discussed at that architectural committee meeting. But it would have to be regularly scheduled. Most architectural committees and other committees at the board are not regularly scheduled meetings. And so, therefore, an argument is made that if they're not regularly scheduled committee meetings, that they are not subject to the open meeting law. I want to clarify something because I think this could be misconstrued. So any time the board is meeting, a quorum of the board is meeting to discuss association business, it has to be an open meeting and 48 hours notice is required. Um, committees, look at whether or not it's a regularly scheduled meeting or not. If it's not, you don't have to follow the open meeting law and do the 48 hours notice. But you can if you want to voluntarily. If it is a regularly scheduled committee meeting, you are required to follow the, the open meeting law. Okay, next question is from Christy, one of my favorite clients. Great to see you here today, Christy. Uh, what is the legal process, if any, when a management company states a homeowner has filed bankruptcy, so that homeowner cannot be put on a payment plan or a notice of demand of payment cannot be sent to this owner? Okay, so great question. So how, what are our rights when the association's rights when we have an owner file bankruptcy? We have limited rights, frankly. Um, the United States Bankruptcy Code is written in such a way that there's an automatic stay placed on collection of the debt against this owner. And so, you know, unless the payment plan is done through the bankruptcy, 
um, you know, we, we cannot be doing a payment plan individually with the lawyer who's, you know, or with the owner who's in bankruptcy, um, because all of those things are tied up in bankruptcy court. Um, can we send, you know, violation letters, pursue the owner for, you know, unpaid assessments? No, you shouldn't. You should be turning the matter over to your legal counsel and let your legal counsel handle that matter with the bankruptcy of that owner from that point forward so that you don't violate the automatic stay of the bankruptcy. And just so you know, those cases can be really expensive. So do not violate the automatic stay of the bankruptcy. Um, we've seen cases where an association has continued to pursue an owner that's in bankruptcy and the association has you know, had to pay a pretty penny to the owner, which is kind of ironic because the owner owes the association money it's flipped and then the association's now paying the owner for violating the stay, which you don't want to have happen. So if you have an owner that's in bankruptcy, make sure that your attorney or management company is handling the bankruptcy and you just got to wait it out. It's painful and it's, it hurts, but um, you know, we, we have certain rights under the bankruptcy code. We know what those rights are. We will protect your interests of the association um, and make sure that you don't violate the stay. Next question is from Marilyn. Can the late fee on assessments be charged monthly until paid, or is it a one-time fee? So great question, Marilyn. It just, it depends. So this is kind of a loaded question. So on late fees, we have to look at, you know, is, are you charging an assessment every month? If you are charging an assessment every month and the owner doesn't pay that assessment in that month, you can charge a late fee for that month's failure to pay assessments. Um, if it's an annual assessment, you can only charge one late fee a year. A common question that I get on late fees is, can we charge late fees on late fees? So let's give an example. Let's say somebody doesn't pay, it's a monthly assessment. So as of right now, it's March 16th. They haven't paid January, February, or March in their assessment. Okay, so for January, you can charge a late fee. If you're a planned community, it's either $15 or 10% of the assessment assessments. You charge your January late fee, right? Then you move to February. They don't pay their February assessment. You can charge a late fee for not paying their February assessment, but you can't double dip and get another late fee for January. Okay. You already got that in January. Now we move to March. If they don't pay their March assessment by the 15th, you can charge the late fee. Like I said, $15 or 10% of the assessment for not paying the March assessment on time. So late fees are tricky. When we get a file from an association to collect on a debt, um, we double check the ledger to make sure that the association has done the late fees correctly. Because if you don't you know, carefully check the ledger, sometimes associations are charging it on the wrong day. Sometimes they're overcharging the amount. Sometimes they're charging late fees on late fees and you can't do any of that under the law. Okay, next question is from Amy. Um, what about when the architectural changes impacts the neighbor negatively and they didn't have approval? So actually, I have a case on this right now where an owner built their addition a foot higher than what was approved by the architectural committee, and it's now blocking a portion of the view of the neighbor. So, I mean, I, I guess it just depends is was the uh, change, did they get approval by the board? even if it negatively impacted the neighbor. Um, you know, I would look at that. Um, I would look at, you know, there's lots of questions on views in Arizona because we have so many beautiful views of the mountains. Um, and so can a view be protected? It, these are all complicated questions. You have to look, is there a view easement in place that's recorded? Do the documents talk about, the CCNRs talk about preserving views and the architectural com committee is gonna have to look at all of that. These are hard questions. So if you're the neighbor that's been negatively impacted, um, you know, you need to go back and see, hey, did the owner get approval before they did the work? Um, B, on what basis did the architectural committee or the board approve this? And C, did they take into consideration that this might negatively impact me? They may have, and they may not have had any choice based upon what they can and can't do under the documents. The next question is from Walter. Would the attorney for the management company have a conflict of, of interest being the attorney for the HOA? Yes, absolutely, 100%. That's a very bad idea. The attorney for the HOA should be only the attorney for the HOA. 
our firm does not ever represent management companies and we represent the HOA so that, or the condo. So that if you have a disagreement with them, you have independent re representation. Um, and the management company's attorney, their loyalty lies with the management company. So it's not a good idea for an association to you know, be using the management company's attorney. You should have an independent attorney that you select to work with you. Next question is from Joan. Uh, we have about 10 more questions. So then they seem to be pretty short. So I think we should be wrapping this up here in the next 10, 15 minutes. Joan asks, can a part-time resident from Canada serve as an officer on the board in Arizona? Short answer, yes. Next question, Linda wrote, is it difficult to change the fiscal year of an association? No, but you probably will need to look at what your bylaws say on this and your articles of incorporation. And it's possible you may need to amend those to change the fiscal year end date. But you should also, that would be the best advice, look at what your documents say and then determine if, if you have to amend the documents to change the fiscal year end date. If your documents are silent on this, then you can just go ahead and, you know, most associations have a year end fiscal date of December 31st. Next question is from Linda. Any information or direction if one condo owner is fighting with another condo owner and upstairs downstairs situation? Asking HOA and property manager to get involved. Do we have to get involved? So that's kind of a loaded question. Um, it, it really depends. Sometimes the upstairs downstairs is a noise issue. Um, the only time I could see the issue requiring the owner, to, the association to get involved is maybe if the owner upstairs made an architectural change and didn't comply with special noise reduction things that may be required in the documents like corking and the flooring or um, also the association may need to get involved if um, there is some sort of a discrimination claim where there's harassment or discrimination out of the Fair Housing Act, we may have to get involved and try to mediate or help the situation as best possible. But in most situations, if it's just kind of like a, you know, differing personalities type of thing, we usually don't get involved. Usually that's considered a neighbor and a neighbor issue, but it really just depends on what the issue is. Is the owner upstairs creating a nuisance? Is there dog barking? I mean, some of those things we would have to get involved in. Question 31 from Betty, a couple of owners are currently trying to implement a trap neuter return program to control feral cats. They use a common area of the community. The previous board approved this. These owners are not abiding by TNR principles. Um, TNR can be helpful, but these owners violate the rules of TNR themselves. It's a really sticky place that the board's in right now. The documents include shutting garage doors and not feeding or sheltering these animals, but they do that as well. Okay, so trapping animals is, is always controversial subject for associations. Um, of course, asking people and enforcing that people don't feed and shelter the animals, that is the best way to stop the feral cat problem. You know, I don't know exactly what they're doing on this trap, neuter, return. Um, maybe they're doing it through the Humane Society. I don't know. So it's hard for me to comment on that. But most associations are not doing that. Just so you know, in my experience, associations typically don't get involved in that. What they do is they ask people to, you know, maintain their property, keep their garage doors closed, trash cans on so that the animals can't get into the trash cans and don't feed or shelter the animals. And that usually helps with the problem. Um, you may want to contact your city that you live in. Um, the city has a lot of great resources, all the cities that we are working with on the seminar today, and they may have some suggestions for you too on this problem. Question 32, Gloria, with regard to the governor's recent update, with regard to the annual meeting, how does the HOA board comply with Arizona statutes and designate a location for members to drop off the ballot the day of the election? HOA board is holding the annual meeting by a conference call and not Zoom. Okay, so great question. So you could do a ballot box somewhere on the property um, where it's locked and secured, where the owners can drop it off the day of the meeting and that would satisfy um, the location for a member to drop off the ballot on the day of the election. Um, next question is from Linda. Nothing in the CCNR is about towing. It's in the HOA rules and regulations. Is that acceptable? No, it has to be in the CCNRs. 
Next question is from Jack, my fellow Green Bay Packer fan and Wisconsin, former Wisconsin resident. Nice to see you, Jack, here today. Miss seeing you. Um, our governing documents allow a 10% increase per year in the assessment rate. Fortunately, our association has been able to keep the assessment rate the same for the past five years. Can the board increase the assessment rate above the 10% limit next year? So I think what you're trying to do is like bank on the fact that you haven't done it for several years, it says for the past five years. So you haven't increased it. And now you want to increase it more because you saved it or banked it those five years. Um, unfortunately, my opinion is you cannot do that. So what would be a better strategy going forward <clears throat> is even in the years where you may not think you need an increase, still do a one or 2% increase so that you don't put yourself in this situation again. Um, I would go with the 10% increase next year. If you want a higher increase above that, follow the procedure in your documents to get the membership approval to allow for a higher than 10% increase. Uh, we have four more questions. Deborah, our CCNRs call for 15 day notice for an open board meeting. You just said 48 hours. Is that a state law and overrides our CCNRs? So I would say that state law does say 48 hours notice prior to any board meeting. If your CCNRs call for 15 days notice, you also will need to comply with that. So you'll have to go with the more restrictive 15 days notice. Next question is from Barnes. Do, do you do owner pays collections? So great question, Barnes. Um, no, we don't. I could probably spend 20 minutes talking about why we don't do that. So owner pay collections is kind of like another way of saying free legal, where the association's attorney pursues delinquent owners in your association for unpaid assessments, but doesn't charge the association. Um, instead, they, ch they charge or they get paid when the owner pays at the end. Um, in my opinion, this type of uh, legal arrangement with, with the attorney is highly unethical, frankly. Um, and in our opinion, it truly, it hurts the homeowner and it hurts the association. So basically what it is, is the attorney says that they're going to do everything for free. I'm going to pursue all these owners for unpaid assessments at no charge. And I'll get paid when the owner pays. But they make you sign this contract. The attorney makes the association sign a contract saying that you have to keep them as your attorney forever. And that if you ever fire them, guess what? It's not free anymore. You owe everything that we've ever charged. Um, and so we've seen this just really sour deal for a lot of associations who want to fire the attorney um, who does the free legal or the owner pays collections. And what ultimately happens is the association ends up having to write a check to the law firm for 40, 50, 60, 70, 80,000, you know, hundred thousand dollars in legal fees when they want to fire them. And that is just wrong. Our firm does not do it that way. We, our fees are very upfront. We only pursue owners who have credit that we can pursue, right? I mean, we don't go after owners who are uncollectible or who have a trustee sale pending. It doesn't make sense. Um, and so we make good decisions on files to pursue, collection files to pursue based upon the owner's credit. And everything we charge is upfront. There's no surprises. You can hire us and fire us and you know, there's no penalty to fire us. It's just, it's how our firm does business. That's you know, a cornerstone of our firm is treating our clients fairly and doing the right thing. And I think those free legals programs and those owner pays collections programs are a serious injustice to boards and associations. And, what happens is people just get lured in with, oh, we don't have to pay anything. Well, you don't have to pay anything now, but this is like an annuity for the lawyer. They're going to get paid. They're going to get paid big at the end and they're counting on that. And so make a good decision, a good business decision, and don't put your association in that position ever. Okay. Another question from Bruce. There are 180 units in our complex in Scottsdale, and we have never had an association. The declarant owns 80 plus units and states that he makes all decisions, including how much assessments are and how much they are raised and how often. 
is this what the declarant doing legal? We would like to form an association with elected members. How much authority does the declarant have? Thank you. Okay, Bruce, I think you need to get legal advice on this because if I had to guess, well, first you got to find out, do we have CCNRs? Do we have articles of incorporation? Do we have bylaws for our association? And then you need to go to an attorney and have them help you determine if you do have all that, maybe the declarant is still in control of the association and they just haven't transferred it yet because they own so many units. Um, and then what legal rights would you have in that situation? If they've never formed one, then that's a separate issue, you know, where you may have to, you know, hire an attorney to help you form one. Okay, last question is from Daniel. And Daniel says, our architectural review committee is defined to be the HOA board members. We've been making decisions based on a majority approval by emails. Is that legal without having an announced meeting? Okay, so good question, Daniel. I would recommend that you not do your approvals anymore, um, you know, because, well, first I'm guessing, I'm going to guess that your architectural review committee is the entire board. So anytime that you have an architectural review discussion, it's a form of the board discussing association business, right? Architectural review. So that really needs to be done during an open board meeting. So try to put your architectural approvals as an item on your agenda for your board meetings so that you fully comply with the open meeting law. If you have to make an, you know, an approval in between a board meeting, I, I don't suggest that you do it by email. First choice would be to do it in person. If you do do it by email, um, make sure at the next regularly scheduled board meeting that you reaffirm that decision in the meeting minutes. Um, but again, I would really caution you and would suggest that you do all those architectural approvals in compliance with the open meeting law um, because you are a quorum of the board discussing association business. So that should really be done during an open board meeting. I would just like to thank everybody for being here today and wanting to make your communities better. And I appreciate our partnership with the many different um, neighborhood services around Arizona who have come together to create these classes. Our fourth class for the spring 2021 virtual HOA Academy is going to be on Tuesday, April 20th at 11 a.m. And our topic for next month is board member boot camp. Um, you've been elected to your board. We're going to tell you everything you need to know about your duties and responsibilities serving on your board. And we're also going to give you tips on how to have a successful association and how to get things done. And as always, um, bring your questions. We always save time at the end to answer every question that's submitted. And finally, I just want to thank again the cities of Avondale, Chandler, Glendale, Goodyear, Mesa, Peoria, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tempe for organizing this virtual HOA Academy. Um, this is our third class in our series of classes. Um, we're planning on having um, classes throughout 2021 um, with these different neighborhood services departments, uh, likely it's still on a virtual platform through 2021. So continue to tune in for the classes. We have lots of great programming that we're planning for the next uh, nine months. So thanks for being here today and we look forward to seeing you next month.